Hey gang, what's a crack a lackin? You know, people often ask me, while the West was being won, while the Indian was being vanquished, what was going on in the East? And I always tell them, well, what was going on was a massive influx of immigration, which led to increasing urbanization and then efforts at what we call Americanization. Let's move on from there. Some of the major cities in America at the... Uh, right after the Civil War. New York, for example, look at the massive growth that New York is seeing from 1860 into 1890, almost a threefold increase. Philadelphia, you're seeing almost the same thing, massive numbers of people moving in. Chicago, look at that tremendous growth you are seeing right there, starting at 109,000. It was considered the city of the broad shoulders, becoming broader and broader and broader. You also have Boston, the nerve center of the American Revolution, now becoming a major urban center. What's going on? What is driving all of this? So why are people moving in, you ask? And who are these people moving in, you ask? Well, the major demographic changes that are happening in America from 1860 to about 1890 is being driven by immigration. You're seeing a lot of new immigrants. And what are they looking for? They're looking for the opportunities being afforded to them by America's Gilded Age. In other words, industrialization. But that is not the only people that are moving Moving in. What you're looking at here is Cyrus McCormick's Mower Reaper, which it was invented in the mid 19th century. And what Cyrus McCormick's Mower Reaper is able to do is it makes agricultural work mechanized, it makes it more efficient, and then what does that do to the demands for labor on the farm? It decreases it. And so once there used to be a demand for a lot of agricultural labor, labor, that demand is going to be shrinking and you're going to have a lot less people that are needed out there. And so what are we going to do? We're going to all move to the cities. And then there is still yet another reason why cities are growing. It may not be quite as obvious because we deal with it every day. It has to do with the invention of the light bulb in 1879 by a man named Thomas Edison. And you're thinking, oh yeah, that's a cliche fact. It's one of those things that we write down on note cards and memorize. But think about the consequences of the light bulb. Cities can now operate longer. They can stay awake longer. They can drive production longer. Factories can stay open longer. People do not need to retire to their homes once the sun goes down. One man comments on the light bulb that it's as good as a policeman. In other words, less shady activity can go on when streets are well lit and corners are not places for crime to happen. Many families, when they arrive in uh, the United States, would find their homes in what's called a tenement building, or a, or a dumbbell tenement. And as you can see by this floor plan, it looks like a, a dumbbell. You're looking at it from the top down, so you have to imagine an identical floor plan directly underneath, and a direct, a exact floor plan directly underneath that one. And these would be stacked really, really high, up to 10 or 12 stories, so that you could put as many people in one space as you possibly could. Now, these are rather uncomfortable dwelling conditions. They would be divided, this, this floor plan you're looking at right here, would be divided between four families, a parlor, a living room, and two bedrooms per per family. And a family is not what you often think of as today's modern nuclear family, mom, dad, 2.5 kids. You're probably talking about extended families, which would include mom, dad, several kids, grandma, grandpa, and whatever cousin just arrived off the boat last week. Now, these dumbbell tenements are going to do a rather poor job of moving air around. So they're going to be hot in the summer. They're going to be cold in the winter. Not very uh, comfortable. As we said, these are for multi-family occupation and multi-people in each family. And get this, this is the most uncomfortable part of the whole thing, at least it would be for me. One toilet per family, how about that? The earlier designs had one toilet per um, 
per uh, uh, floor. And then the earlier designs before that had one toilet per gasp building. And that would go also for um, faucets, you know, city codes. You had city codes back then that said you have to have one faucet per building, one water source per building. How would you like that? Think about what into the tenement housing, though. Think about how a tenement building is uh, a representation of all that America has to offer right now. Think about the Bessemer steel that Andrew Carnegie had to produce in order to make these buildings go up. Think about John D. Rockefeller and his providing oil for all of the lamps to keep these places lit. Think about Thomas Edison, who would later replace Rockefeller's oil and provide electric lighting. And then, of course, do not forget the immigrant labor that is necessary to build all of these dumbbell tenements. So next, let's look at a couple of, uh, of photographs taken by a man named Jacob Reese who draw he, for he will dramatize what it looks like in these dumbbell tenements like I said multi people per family these are not modern nuclear families and a lot of these places it's not well kept your your landlord uh, is under no obligation to keep these places clean or free from rodents or anything like that a protestant minister named uh, Josiah Strong wrote a book in 1885 called Our Country in which he described what he saw as the problem of urbanization. He writes, the city is the nerve center of our civilization. It is also the storm center. The fact, therefore, that it is growing much more rapidly than the whole population is full of significance. The city has become a serious menace to our civilization. It has a pe peculiar attraction for the immigrant. Because our cities are so largely foreign, Romanism, that is, Roman Catholicism, finds in them its chief strength. For the same reason, a saloon, a bar, together with the intemperance and the liquor power which it represents, is multiplied in the city. So Josiah Strong doesn't think cities are a good thing. Roman Catholics are, are organizing to drink. Not only does the proportion of the poor increase with the growth of the city, but the condition becomes more wretched. The poor of a city of 8,000 inhabitants are well off compared with many in New York. And there are no such depths of woe which utter and heart-wringing wretchedness in New York as in London. And then he goes on to what he fears is one of the most um, frightful parts of urbanization. He says, Socialism not only centers in the city, but is almost confined to it. That's not actually true. The populists were becoming quite socialist out west, but he clearly hasn't been paying attention to that. And the materials of its growth are multiplied with the growth of the city. Here is heaped the social dynamite. Here inequality is greatest. So let's move on now and talk about how some of these new immigrants were received. Are the new immigrants. Let's compare the new immigrants to the old immigrants. Remember the old immigrants coming in the 1840s and the 1850s were, th were from Northern and Western Europe and they typically did a pretty good job of assimilating and moving into the American uh, mainstream culture, especially the Germans and then within a couple of generations, the Irish. So in the 1860s, look at that, 90% of Americans, or I'm sorry, of immigrants are going to be from Northern and Western Europe and really not even a, a measurable somewhere around 5, 6% of immigrants are going to become, are coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. By the 1870s, you're looking at around 70% coming from the centers of old immigration and you're looking at around 10%, 9% coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. By the 1880s, that number is holding about the same 
but we're seeing again a jump in the so-called new immigrants from southern and eastern Europe. Have a look at the 1890s. What's going on? You're seeing a major demographic shift where you're seeing more and more uh, immigrants coming from southern and eastern Europe by the 1890s. So this is the, in the broad sweep, this is the period in American history that we're looking at right now, 1891 to 1900, right around there, and then look at how things are going to jump again from 1901 to 1910. These are, of course, the new immigrants. What sort of work are they doing? How are they going to be occupied? Have a look at the shift that we're seeing from 1870 to 1910. The total labor force in 1870, 50% is going to be working in agriculture. And look what's going on in manufacturing, construction, commerce. Those numbers are all down. When you jump down to 1910, the number has dropped in agriculture to 31%, and all of the other numbers have jumped up just a little bit. Now, why are people coming in such numbers? I'm going to say it again for you. It's industrial jobs. The opportunities being afforded by the American Gilded Age, the growth of the railroad industry, the growth of the steel industry, the growth of the oil industry is bringing people in in huge numbers. You've got railroads in the west, you've got skyscrapers, you've got heavy industry in the east, and don't forget parents, there's even something for the kids. Historians often talk about what's called push factors and pull factors behind immigration. Push factors are going to be things that are going to literally push people out of their home. And so migration might not be voluntary when you're being pushed out. So a push factor would be something like crop failure. You not you can't eat enough at your home so you've got to find something else. Another push factor would be a push factor would be population growth. Too many people occupying the same spot, not enough resources, we've got to move on. Another push factor could be an oppressive government, a government that doesn't like your face, a government, government that doesn't like your religion, government that doesn't like your politics, and is going to become oppressive to the point where you've got to leave. Of course, that includes religious persecution. Say the Russian government doesn't like Jews, and they didn't, and they're going to be really hostile toward them, then Jews are going to find a place to go in the United States. So pull factors are the opposite. It's still factors that are motivating people to migrate, but it tends to be a lot more voluntary. So job opportunities is going to be your biggest and most attractive uh, pull factor, especially in the United States. Also, there's the, the uh, promise of available land, such as uh, that which was um, widely advertised through the Homestead Act passed by Congress in 1862. Then, of course, there's the freedom of religion that the United States um, affords everybody. You're not going to find government death squads roaming around beating you up because you have the wrong religion. Now, let's temper that. Of course, we know that Roman Catholics did see a lot of persecution at this time, but there is no system-wide attempt to execute them or move them out or anything like that. There, of course, job opportunities. Let me say it again. Number one pull factor is going to be job opportunities in the United States. There are two ports of entry for immigrants during this time. In the east, we're looking at Ellis Island in New York. And in the west, we're looking at Angel Island in California. So, obviously, those who are going to come through Ellis Island are going to be European immigrants. And then those who are going to come through Angel Island in California are going to be Asian immigrants. When an immigrant shows up at Ellis Island, you don't just pass under the Statue of Liberty and walk right in. You're going to be subject to medical inspection. People are going to go over you and make sure you don't have any kind of communicable disease that can be passed on to the general population. You're also going to be subject to some kind of mental competency test. We want to make sure that the insane are not being let in. 
Also, there's the overall fitness inspection. Let's make sure that you're not going to be an invalid and that you're not going to be dependent on the others here. So, immigrants are not just going to be walking in. They're going to be subject to all these various forms of uh, interrogation and, and questioning before they're going to be moving in. This next picture is one of my favorites. A group of Jewish kids, I believe, coming from Russian Poland. Um, I wonder who gave them the American flags. I just think that's a really neat picture. Moving on, let's talk about the new immigrant experience and contrast that with the old immigrant experience. A girl named Mary Anton, who is a Russian, um, or really a Polish uh, immigrant from Polish Russia, she writes a book in 1912 called The Promised Land. So at last, I was going to America, really, really going. At last, the boundaries burst, the arch of heaven soared, a million suns shone out for every star. The winds rushed in from outer space, roaring in my ears, America, America, America. So obviously, Mary Anton is among the immigrants who have a great optimism for what they're going to find in America. Um, another immigrant sort of tempers this attitude a little bit. I think this is kind of clever. When I came to, I came to America because I heard that the streets were paved with gold. When I came, I learned three things. First, streets in America are not paved with gold. Second, streets in America are not paved at all. Third, the Americans expected me to pave them. So let's contrast the old immigrant who came from Germany, who came from England, who came from Ireland, with the new immigrant who's often coming from places like Greece or Poland or Russia or uh, the Balkans or somewhere like that. The old immigrant are typically going to be Protestant, not the Irish, of course. They were Roman Catholic. But by and large, the old immigrants held on to some kind of Protestant faith. The new immigrants are Roman Catholic, they're Orthodox, or they're Jewish. To a lot of Americans, these are foreign religions, or these are foreign um, expressions of faith, and a lot of Americans are going to be uh, native, I guess, Americans are going to be hostile to, the, um, to these faiths. The old immigrant was generally skilled and literate. Remember, a lot of the old immigrants came over um, because of political uh, wars, political oppression around the 1830s through the 1840s, and they were political liberals and well-to-do. The new immigrant is generally unskilled and uneducated. The only life the new immigrant may have known is on his small family plot somewhere in Russian Poland. They don't have the skills or the education that the old immigrants had. Old immigrants were liberals, and we of course mean this in the classic 19th century way. They were seeking laissez-faire, and they were seeking Republican government. It's not that the new immigrants aren't, it's just that they don't have any experience in democracy. They come from authoritarian governments, and so a lot of people think them to be socialists, anarchists, or some kind of political radical. The old immigrants often came with families, and they meant to stay. They didn't want to leave. The new immigrants often, not always, but often came as birds of passage, meaning they were going to stay for a season, make some money, and then go home. The old immigrants were fair-skinned. They looked, to some anyway, American. The new immigrant was a little bit swarthier, a little bit darker skinned, and to many people they looked more foreign. So another difference is how the new immigrant adapted to life in America once he was here. The old immigrants sought to quickly assimilate, to drop the accent, to convert to whatever uh, uh, religion it was. My family dropped Roman Catholicism and picked up Anglicanism. Um, the new immigrants weren't so quick to drop the old customs and, and the old behaviors and the old beliefs. Instead, they set up their own institutions, um, their own their own cultural enclaves, apart from the, quote, 
American institutions, and this would include churches. They would seek to preserve Roman Catholicism, and they would seek to pre preserve it in their own language. So you would have Polish-speaking Roman Catholic churches. They don't just go to whatever Roman Catholic church is available. They say, no, we're Polish Roman Catholics, or no, we're Lithuanian Roman Catholics, or whatever you have. Also, they tried to establish their own schools. This is especially true of the Jews who don't want to see their kids lose the ability to speak Yiddish or Hebrew. Also, they want to establish their own newspaper to follow their own events, to keep their eye on current events back home. So they, rem they keep a foothold in the old world. Grocery stores. This is especially true, again, of the Jews who need to keep cult uh, kosher by not eating um, food that is unclean by their standards. And so they're going to want to keep their own dietary laws um, up to date and common and continue to practice those ideas. They establish what's called um, ghettos which are essentially ethnic enclaves. These are communities which appear almost just like the old communities would back home. So let's look at a few examples, a few examples of these. Mulberry Street in New York is going to be known as Little Italy. And this is where all of the street signs are going to be in Italian. The Roman Catholic Church is going to be giving an Italian mass. And you can get along speaking in Italian just as easily as you could in English. Moving on, this is Pell Street in are also known as Little China. And you can see the street signs are in Chinese. Um, most A lot of the, the dress is going to be um, indicative of Asian cultures. And this is going to try to preserve what they think of as, as Chinese. Center Street in uh, New York is also called Jewish Poland. And there you can see the Hebrew or the Yiddish words written on the, the window back there. And a lot of your traditionally Jewish uh, folks are going to be migrating and moving to this area in order to preserve their cultures. At the same time that the new immigrant is trying to preserve uh, their, their traditional culture, beliefs, religion, I think there's a move here that signals an embrace of American ideas and American identity as well. If you look at this New Year's card from a, a Jewish community in America, I think these two ideas are dramatized for us. If you look at the right side, you're looking at the old immigrant and look at these folks. They look sort of um, downtrodden. They, they don't look too happy. Um, flying overhead. There we go. Flying overhead, you can see the old imperial eagle. I believe that's from Russia. And these folks have, you know, just basically everything their own thrown into pillow pillowcases, and they're trying to come to America. So there they are, not looking so great. Now, if you look at the other side, you see these guys are dressed in Western clothing. They're dressed in, they've got their nice bowler hats on, nice shoes. And if you go to the, um, on top of them there, you can see the American eagle, and that American eagle is gripping an American crest, an American flag. And look very carefully at the language that's written on the banner that he's carrying. That is Hebrew. And so the American eagle is embracing a new kind of American. And I think that's actually a very beautiful, uh, very encouraging picture of Americanism. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. This is another one that I find to be a really cool symbol. Again, it's a, a, a Jewish New Year's card, and it's got an inscription from the prophet Micah down there. And what's in there, if you look, there's a traditional American landmark behind them, the famous bridge in New York City. Uh, but at the same time, they have their traditional customs and belief being, uh, being displayed. Uh, so at, at once, it's... Um, it's the new identity, and it's seamlessly being integrated into the old identity. It says in two languages, Happy New Year. I mean, what could be more American than somebody embracing an American custom and an American landscape in the language of their choice? 
Well, not everybody sees it as, as I see it. I find these expressions to be rather encouraging. I find uh, anytime someone is, is expressing Americanism and the ideals of Americanism in another language, another culture, and another cultural context, I find that to be really cool. Um, a lot of folks in the mid-19th century did not. Take, for example, the sociologist E.A. Ross. E.A. Ross writes, Observe immigrants in their gatherings. You are struck by the fact that from 10 to 20 percent are hirsute, low browed, big faced persons of obviously low mentality. They clearly belong in skins, in wattled huts at the close of the Great Ice Age. Those, these ox like men, are descendants of those who always stayed behind. So the sociologist E.A. Ross not thinking too highly of the new immigrants. Let's look at another political cartoon that takes a similar position. The caption, uh, which you can't read so I've printed it for you, says, They would close to the newcomer, the bridge that carried them and their fathers over. So there you have one of the new immigrants coming over with everything he owns thrown across his back and who is holding up their hands saying no stop not here look at these guys they could be the wealthy middle class they could be the wealthy industrialists they could be the factory owners these are the ones who control the majority of wealth in america's gilded age and then look at their shadows behind them Look at who it is. Those are their shadows of their former selves, or maybe of their fathers or of their grandfathers. All of them poor immigrants. And now here we are turning up our noses at those who would come to America looking for the same opportunity. This, this cartoon right here is called The Last Yankee. I think this one really points out a lot of the racial fears that many Americans had um, racial attitudes that many Americans had with toward the new immigration. This one was in 1886. Look at this tall and stout and noble looking American. He almost looks like Uncle Sam. And look at the ugly little children. Uh, those are the immigrants, according to this cartoonist, that are congregating about him, holding out their hands as if they want him to do something for them. Of course, all of the signs are being, um, all the signs are now in uh, languages other than English, showing the disappearance of what this guy believes to be the traditional American culture. Again, the last Yankee, he calls himself, or the cartoonist says, I think this, um, this has a lot of echoes into today as we start talking about English only education or um, you know what 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 sort of, uh, of things we're gonna afford to immigrants and stuff like that and here you have another cartoon here's Uncle Sam and he is looking at this mass of humanity which is just disembarked off of the boat you can see the Statue of Liberty in the background so this is Ellis Island and these people are obviously up to no good according to the cartoonist this is called the evils of unrestricted immigration this is a newspaper put out by a group called the American Protective Society. It's called the Patriot. And obviously it's an uh, anti-immigrant nativist uh, kind of piece of propaganda in which they claim to stand for certain things. Let's take a, a look at some of the details here. They are in favor of the protection of American mechanics. That's American workers against foreign pauper labor. They're in favor of foreigners having to live in this country for 21 years before they can vote. They're in favor of our present free school system. They're in favor of carrying out the laws of the state as regard to sending back foreign paupers and criminals. So obviously they're taking a pretty strong stand against immigration. You continue, they're opposed to papal aggression. That's the Pope and Roman Catholicism. They're opposed to foreigners holding office, and they're opposed to foreign Catholics ever holding office. They're opposed to raising foreign military companies in the United States. Look at what else they don't like. They don't like nuns, and they don't like Jesuits. Jesuits are an order of the Catholic Church. 
They're also opposed to being taxed for the support of foreign paupers. Again, none of these paupers, uh, no, sorry, none of these immigrants could be anything but paupers. They're all just uh, drains on resources. Uh, foreign paupers, millions of dollars yearly. This is a um, periodical of the American Protective uh, Association. Let's look a little bit closer at their goal. The goals of the American Protective Association, they're called the APA, to sharply restrict immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe. They want to restrict office holding to native-born Americans. They want to entirely ban Roman Catholics from public office. And Grover Cleveland, who's president at the time, said, It is said that the quality of recent immigration is undesirable. The time is quite within recent memory when the same thing was said of immigrants who, with their descendants, are now numbered among our best citizens. So I would think back to that cartoon in which all of those um, wealthy industrialists or wealthy middle class guys were trying to keep the immigrant from disembarking off the ship. So that leads us to the next part, which is what we call the progressive response to the new immigration. The playwright Israel Zangwell wrote a, a play called The Melting Pot, and that is where we get the idea and that, uh, that jargon, that idiom, the melting pot, is from his play. He writes, America is God's crucible, the great melting pot, where all the races of Europe are melting and reforming, German and Frenchmen, Irishmen and Englishmen, Jews and Russians, into the crucible with you all. God is making the American. And what better symbol of making the American can you think of than the construction of, that's right, you're looking at the construction of the Statue of Liberty around 1886. The poetess Emma Lazarus is selected to write the poem, which will be later fastened to the base of the Statue of Liberty. It's called the New Colossus. Look at how her attitudes toward the immigrants are quite different from the nativist attitudes. She writes, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand, a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that Twin Cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. That's the New Colossus by Emma Lazarus. Theodore Roosevelt, who had become president of the United States in 1901, also had an opinion on the new immigrants and how they should be regarded. He writes, in the first place, we should insist that if the immigrant who comes here in good faith becomes an American and assimilates himself to us, he shall be treated on an exact equality with everyone else. For it is an outrage to discriminate against any such man because of creed or birthplace or origin. But then listen to what he says. But this is predicated upon the person's becoming in every facet an American, and nothing but an American. There can be no divided allegiance here. Any man who says he is an American, but something else also, isn't an American at all. So Theodore Roosevelt didn't like what he called hyphenated Americans. He would not like the idea of being a Polish American, a German American, and I doubt he would care much for the idea of Mexican American or Chinese American. He wanted you to be all American. What exactly does that mean, being an American? Another example of how progressive America received the immigrants is from Hull House, established by a woman 
and um, named Jane Adams in 1886. This is part of what's called the Settlement House Movement. So let's just take a closer look at Jane Adams, her work and biography. Jane Adams was a middle class woman who used family money. She was, she was from money and she was from wealth to establish Hull House in Chicago in 1886. And she lived there for 20 years using her settlement house to bring in immigrants and to teach them English, job skills, and educate the children of immigrants. Hull House is significant because it inspired many other settlement houses across the country. And Adams also endeavored in, or in other work, spent her lifetime battling for things like garbage renewal, playgrounds, better street lighting, and police protection. That's Jane Adams. There's Jane Adams with a group of immigrant children, and she's teaching them literacy skills. Another picture of Jane Adams gathering her immigrant uh, children's school around her. In her own words, Jane Addams says the Settlement House, then, is an experimental effort to aid in the solution of the social and industrial problems which are engendered by the modern conditions of life in the great city. In other words, Settlement Houses are here as a solution to the problems of the Gilded Age. This is what we mean by calling her a progressive. It insists that these problems are not confined to any one portion of a city. It is an attempt to relieve, at the same, at the same time, the overaccumulation at one end of society and the destitution at the other. But it assumes that this overaccumulation and destitution is most sorely felt in the things that pertain to social and educational privileges. And this is one of the things that Jane Addams wants to do. Jane Addams is part of a larger movement called Americanization. And Americanization programs are going to spread out throughout the United States. So let's take a closer look and define just what these things are. Uh, settlement houses, as we said, were a part of a larger movement called Americanization. The purpose was to enroll immigrants into schools in which they would learn English, receive job training, become acculturated to American customs and ideas, receive religious instruction in many cases, and that religious instruction is to drive out Roman Catholicism and uh, teach people Protestantism. And it's also there so we can teach immigrants basic civics courses in the rudiments of republicanism, which is our form of government. Later critics, of course, are, are going to look at this as you may be looking at this and saying, well, okay, a lot of this is, is all right, but the programs devalue native cultures and languages and they promote a form of cultural hegemony in which white Anglo-Saxon and Protestant values prevailed. So they would later say, isn't there room in the American identity for other ideas? Do we all have to fit into this white Anglo-Saxon Protestant way of looking at things? 30 states ended up passing compulsory Americanization laws, meaning if you're going to be an immigrant and you're going to be a resident in this state, you're going to have to go into these Americanization programs. Well, there's one of them. Granite City putting out its uh, Americanization school right there. Um, I want you to look at this at this advertisement. Look at the bottom. It says, "Become an American citizen. Keep America great. Learn the language." And look at the um, center advertisement they've got. I'll enlarge it for you. These two men are brothers. One is an American citizen, and the other has just come to this country with their old mother. See the difference in the way they dress and look. America is a great country. In America, everybody has a chance. Everybody who comes to America from the old country ought to learn the American language and become an American citizen. If the people that come to America do not become Americans, this country will soon be like the old country. So there's an assumption there that you know Americans speak English. Uh, another assumption is that America is better than the old country, or else you wouldn't have come here, right? And if you don't get with the program and Americanize and become like the mainstream Protestant white Anglo-Saxon culture, then America's not going to be America anymore. 
There's a uh, one from Cleveland, which also passed compulsory Americanization laws. Many peoples, one language. We're going to teach you English. This might be a familiar sight to you. We do this every day. Here are students in a public school. Public schools at this point in the late 19th century are becoming mandatory by many states. And here you have children that are standing up and reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, which was first written in 1892. Let's take a closer look at the Pledge of Allegiance. If you were to take the pledge in 1892, you would say, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. That was written in 1892 by Edward Bellamy, who was a socialist and a Baptist. The two were not necessarily mutually exclusive at that time. So what's missing from that? Well, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic, for which it stands one, there's no under God there. Um, that's, that's a very shorter, more terse version of the pledge. It's updated in 1923. In, not, in the 1920s, uh, we move toward another uh, a conservative movement in American history in which people promote something called 100% Americanism, which we'll get to in the 20s. But look at how the pledge was updated in 1923. I pledge allegiance to the flag, and let's be clear about what flag, of the United States, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. What's missing? What's missing? Can you figure it out? That's right. Let's look at the pledge as it's updated in 1924. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Let's be sure because there's we have to claim, you know, exactly what country we're talking about. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. What's still missing? You're going, wait a minute, under God is still missing from the pledge. So I think it's time that we have ourselves a pop quiz. So when were the words under God added to the Pledge of Allegiance? I'll give you some multiple choice. Was it during the New Deal under FDR and, uh, and during the Great Depression. Was it during World War II? There you have the soldiers putting up the flag at Iwo Jima. Or was it during the Cold War, the 1950s through really the 1980s? Maybe you guessed it right, it's the Cold War. Under God was added to the Pledge of Allegiance in 1954 as a way to distance ourselves and distinguish ourselves from the atheist, godless communists of the Soviet Union. Um, I did some research in college in which I was trying to find the political debate in Congress over this. Um, I wanted to know who was opposed to it and, and for what reason, and is this a violation of the... Um, you know, First Amendment or something like that. You know how much discussion I found over this? Absolutely nothing. Everybody in Congress voted for this. We all said, yeah, that's not a problem. Um, I wonder if, if we had tried something like that today, if there would be any discussion. Just a little uh, bit of extra information for you. This was the original salute that Americans and American school, ch school children would take in the 19, uh, uh, late 19th century through the 1920s. There they are saluting the flag. Can you guess why it changed? The last portion of our YouTube video is on sex. That's right, we've been talking about immigration, urbanization, tenement buildings. Now let's finally get to the good stuff. Let's talk about sex, baby. Urbanization brought fears about sex. It's an interesting observation. Urbanization saw a parallel rise in concern regarding sex both premarital sex and sex when it when you buy it in the form of prostitution as americans move to the city more conservative americans became concerned about sexual purity 
and began to occupy themselves with progressive reforms to try to do something about sex. It was called the Crusade Against White Slavery. That is based on a book called The Great War on White Slavery, published in 1911. It called for an all-out war on the, on the supposed rise of sexual vice and prostitution in the cities. Again, people are beginning to associate the cities with all kinds of, of sexual deviance and sexual misbehavior. Is this true or not? I think what's probably happening is that as communities, traditional rural communities, are breaking down, parents and the larger community and the church um, no longer has as much control or oversight over the behavior of young people. And so when young people are going off to work or they're going off to school and they're spending more time away from the community and from parents and, and from the traditional sources of, of morality, people begin to worry about what they're doing. You see another example of this in the 1920s, after the automobile is invented and teenagers start to drive, then they go off and people assume that they're doing things in these cars. Was it true? Actually, not really. You, it, you didn't see a whole lot more sexual activity in the 1920s than you saw before. But the fear that people are doing these things, it's what's on the rise. And of course, we act based not on real data, but we act on what we believe is true. So here are some illustrations from the book, The Great War on White Slavery. And look at the one to the left. And you can see the caption reads, Have you a girl to spare? 60,000 white slaves die every year. The vice resorts cannot run without this number is replaced annually. And so it's warning you. Are you willing to give your daughter to keep up this terrible business? And the sign says, Wanted 60,000 girls to take the place of the 60,000 white slaves who will die this year. Obviously, that's not a real sign. But the fear is there that young girls are turning to prostitution in great numbers. This is actually not true. Prostitution in the late 19th century was actually on the decline. That's right. Let me say that again. Prostitution was actually on the decline in the late 19th century. But the fears were that it was on the in increase. Again, it seems that we're acting on our fears about urbanization more than we are actual information. Look at the one on the right. Friends meeting an immigrant girl at the dock. Nothing good can come of this meeting. The girl was met at New York by two friends who took her in charge. These friends were two of the most brutal of all the white slave traders who are in the traffic. Foreign girls are more helplessly at the mercy of white slave hunters than girls at home. Every year, thousands of girls arriving in America from Italy, Sweden, Germany are never heard of again. Now, did this illicit traffic occur? Yes, yes, it did, of course. It happens today, unfortunately. But it didn't happen at, to the levels and, and to the degree that reformers thought it was happening. We are believing in the late 19th century that sexual deviance is just taking over. And this seems to be growing in parallel to immigration and urbanization. We are associating our fears with regard to sex and sexual purity with the changing demographic landscape of the United States. It's a very curious scenario. Here's a couple more. This one, the one on the left, the love game. A pander working the love game assumes the role of a banker's son seeking rest and fresh air. 
He hoodwinks the girls by stories of great wealth and position. The upper part of the picture shows the gay times. That means happy times. Gay times promised. Beware of these smooth talkers in the city, ladies. Beware of what will happen to you. Be on guard against these sexual predators. Look at the one on the right, the first step. Ice cream parlors of the city and fruit stores combined, largely run by, what's that word? Foreigners. Are the places where scores of girls have taken their first step downward. That's right. It starts with ice cream, ladies. Does her mother know the character of the place and the man she is with? I tell you, if I run, if I ran an ice cream parlor, I'd be really upset with, uh, with, with the author of, of The Great War on White Slavery. Because look, it all begins in an ice cream shop. Again, look at what's happening. Statistics do not bear out. Historical st statistics done by historians doing original research does not bear out that there was an increase in prostitution or what people would consider to be sexual deviance. In fact, most of it was on the decline, but we fear that it's on the increase because of the changing demographic outlook, because of the changing um, uh, uh, landscape, the, the urban landscape. Well, New York is going to get so serious about putting away vice and ending what they believe to be sexual deviancy, that they're going to establish the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, and it's going to be headed by a man named Anthony Comstock. There he is, Anthony Comstock. He's a former Civil War um, soldier. And he's the proud sponsor of a federal law prohibiting what he thinks of as obscene content in the U.S. mail. Obscene content could be anything from legitimate pornography to birth control or information about birth control. He thinks simply talking about birth control is um, a little bit too provocative for some people. Now, Anthony Comstock boasts that he had confiscated no fewer than 202,679 obscene pictures and photos. And I'm sure he went through every single one of them, making sure they were suitably obscene. 4,185 boxes of pills, powders, etc. used by abortionists. That would be a catch-all phrase for, for birth control. And of course, 26 obscene pictures framed on walls of saloons. So you can imagine Anthony Comstock at home in his living room going through all 202,000 obscene pictures and going, I'm going to ban this one. Anthony Comstock's proud claim was that he had driven at least 15 people to suicide when he revealed their sexual deviancy. An interesting claim to fame, Anthony Comstock. <laughs>